Revive School Lesson 58. We're in Luke 14, and we're going to jump right in because there's a great banquet going on in the beginning of Luke 14. One Sabbath, it begins in verse 1, when he went, and he's talking about Jesus, went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees. Not just any Pharisee, a leading Pharisee, and they were watching him closely. Keep that in mind. We're going to get there in a second. Verse 2. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. Now, so, sorry about that. I'm using Gordy as a visual aid. So if you're listening online and you don't get to see Gordy just sitting here, it's, it's sorry, you miss out on it. But his body is swollen with fluid. Some of your translations call it dropsy. I don't know what this is. It's a disease that's only there in this particular passage. Okay, they're at a meal at the home of one of the leading Pharisees, a leading Pharisee. Jesus is invited in. They don't say anything. They're watching him closely, and they bring out this guy that's got this <laughs> disease, and it's such, it's painful, it's incurable, it's not healthy, and we don't know who he is. There is even the chance that he's a relative of this leading Pharisee. And they're at the table. This is, I love this, because this, all of this is going to happen at this banquet table, not as tall as our tables. They were shorter, and they reclined in a, at an angle in kind of a U-shaped around this table. So having the table here with Mindy's painting is, is really cool for this setting today, because they're at the table, and they just bring in this guy, and they stick him in front of Jesus. And... He sits there and everybody is staring and they're looking at him and they're looking at Jesus and what's he going to do? You couldn't ignore him. He's too obvious. He's sitting <laughs> right there. And as I'm reading this passage, all I could think of was from Star Wars and Admiral Akbar going, it's a trap, it's a trap, because they're out to trap Jesus with this guy. Just sitting there and it's like will he see will he heal on the sabbath or won't he because this is the sabbath they're not supposed to do any work on the sabbath um so are they going to do that verse three is fascinating in response or some of the uh, translations actually say jesus answered well even they haven't asked him anything they just sat this guy in front of him <laughs> <laughs> he just sat him there so Jesus doesn't do anything. He looks at the rest of them, looks around, and he finally goes, okay, you're the experts. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, our terminology is kind of like crickets. Crickets means there's no sound, and all you can hear is those cricket, 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 you know. They don't say anything. So Jesus looks around at them. You don't have any answers? He took the man, healed him, and sent him on his way. <laughs> and there he goes. Thank you much, Gordy, for being a visual aid for those watching. You know, it's this awkward, bizarre, marvelous moment because they aren't even saying anything. And he heals him and sends him on his way. Then he looks at them all. Okay, you've been setting me up. And he asks another question in verse 5. Which of you whose son or ox falls into a well? will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. Now, isn't that fun? Your son or your ox? I was going to say, what a random comparison. Like your animals or your kid? Yeah. It's, well, you know, it's part of your livelihood. You know, you're supposed to care for your animals. And an ox is a working uh, animal. Um, I grew up on the farm. You had to feed the animals on Sunday. Dad would never take out a tractor, never do work in the field, but you still had to feed the animals. Well, if there's something that happened, you, you dealt with it. Well, won't you pull him out? Look at what happens again in verse 6. To this, they could find no answer. Crickets. Nothing. And Jesus is just letting the uncomfortableness just kind of permeate the room. And I, I was cracking up. It is an awkward, awkward banquet. Nobody's saying anything but Jesus. He's asking questions, and then he just deals with it. So then he goes, okay. 
since we're at a banquet and you're not talking, I'm going to give you the banquet advice column. There's something fun about the banquet. If you go through Luke, you find that Luke multiple times is having Jesus having interaction with the Pharisees, but also with other people at meals. They are at the table multiple times through this entire gospel. So I think it's kind of fun that Mindy's put in to the painting the table because so much of the interaction in Luke happens around a table with a meal and an encounter. And so Jesus goes into his Martha Stewart mode. I never thought I'd ever use that kind of description. But he says, this is how you really do a banquet. So uh, he told them this parable when he noticed how they were treating him and how they would choose the best places for themselves, picking out the best seats. And so he goes into verse 8 through 11, and he tells this parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, wedding banquets are important because that's part of the expectation of the end times, the return of the Messiah, the culmination of everything is always illustrated with a wedding banquet, Old Testament and new. But he says, don't recline at the best place because they would come in um, early on and the most um, important guests would come at the end. And if you got in the wrong spot, you'd have to get up and move and it'd be very awkward and everybody would look at you. So he's telling them, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. And in verse 9, the one who invited both of you may come in and say to you, excuse me, Give your place to this man, and then in humiliation, you're going to proceed to take the lowest place because everybody else has taken their places. And he goes on. But when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place. So that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And he concludes this little description with, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That, that incredible, glorious element of the king who is servant, understanding and showing them you have to serve to become exalted. And they listen to that and they go, oh, well, that's interesting. So I need to, well, we're not sure we get that. Because then he turns to the host. Notice he turns to the one who invited him. This is the guy, a leading Pharisee, who brought in the guy with this disease, plopped him in front of Jesus to see what he would do. And he turns to the one who invited him and said, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might in invite you back and you would be repaid. But in contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind. Do you see what Jesus, guys, do you see what Jesus is doing in setting this guy up? What do you see, how, how, he's, how he's talking to the host? Well, it kind of goes back to what we've talked about earlier. He's turning to the host and saying, don't pick your guests, just break, invite everybody, basically. Invite everybody. And do you notice how he brought in someone who was maimed or lame, put him in front of Jesus as a trap, not as a guest. So Jesus is even pointing that out to him. And, oh, this is incredible. If you do that, notice what he says, you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. It's not now. This is kingdom aspect. And you missed out on all of this. Jesus healed the man with dropsy or whatever that disease is and sent him off healed. And here Jesus is saying, look, invest in those that you consider to be the bottom of the pile those that you would never touch because they're unclean because the goal is at the resurrection of the righteous. He's not condemning holding a party. 
He's not even condemning holding a party for one's family or friends. He went to those kinds of gatherings. You're going to see that in John chapter 2 later on. But he's condemning an attitude that does good for the sake of a tangible earthly reward. Uh, but you know what? He finally gets a response at this banquet. After telling that story, look at verse 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, so the guest is saying to Jesus, the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God is blessed. What? This guy is out of context. He's trying to sound, oh, the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God is blessed. What? Again, somebody just popping up with something that's to sound important. But Luke keeps Jesus at center stage. And basically, Jesus is going to use this as an opportunity to teach. And in effect, he's going to come up with this line. You admire the ideal, but you're not prepared to act on it. So listen, this is what Jesus tells him. It's another parable, another story in verses 16 and 17. Then he said, a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his slave to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. Something cultural to understand here in, in, as he's telling this story is a double invitation was normal standard practice. You would send out an invitation, you would get an RSVP, we are coming. That was the first invitation. And then when it was time, another invitation would come, it's ready, come now. So it's kind of that, that pre-invitation, you know, save the date kind of thing, and you would respond, and that means you're coming. And then here it is, it's now ready. That's the double invitation that's going on. But without exception, verse 18, they all began to make excuses. And Jesus is basically saying, folks, I'm going to give you the excuses that you come up with. And they're going to sound lame to everybody. And here's why. The first one said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Now, they might have enjoyed some of the humor of this at first until they realized he was talking about them. We, we do that with Jesus quite a bit. We love to go, oh, look how he's getting them. And then you realize he's stomping on your toes and challenging your position. But they would hear it as a weak excuse because the buyer may have been legally obligated to go out and complete the purchase, but the late notice would be heard as just an incredibly weak excuse. Uh, so it would be an injury to the hosts. I, I'm not coming because I've got to take care of this. You knew this day was coming. So another said in verse 19, hey, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. And notice he says, I ask you to excuse me. It's inconceivable and it's an insult. And then the third comes in verse 20. I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. This is getting closer to sounding legit. It really is because if you remember back in Deuteronomy 20 uh, verse 7 and Deuteronomy 24 verse 5, for those of you who were in revive school in the Pentateuch, you remember that when somebody got married, they were excused from military service for how long? One year. Yes whole year, you were to focus on your marriage. I just got married. I can't come. So he's, there, this, this excuse is taking the, the biblical truth and twisting it because it was your excuse from military service, not from celebrations, not from, from gathering. So these are all the, the dog ate my homework stuff. And two of them, I ask you to excuse me, that sounds pretty nice. Kevin, what do you think? Does that sound... I just ask you to excuse me. I think it's more uh, 
Will you accept my excuse is more what it sounds like. You're getting closer. I would have thought that too. And, and then I started to do some, some, some digging in here. And that's kind of how we translate it into the English. But it literally is, please consider me excused. I'm telling you that I'm excused. I'm telling you that everything is okay. I'm, I'm telling you how you're supposed to respond to me. So it's not just, oh, please accept my excuse, or I'm sorry. It's, you will ex consider me excused because I've told you so. Jesus is really laying it on pretty, pretty thick. You don't have an option, host. The people who don't accept the master's invitation in favor of everyday pursuits. Does that sound familiar? The first guy said, I I'm excused because of my possessions. I bought a field. The second said, uh, I can't come because I got to work. I've got these five new yoke of oxen. I I've got work. I don't have time for you. The third, oh, no, no. My wife, you know, I can't, I can't come. It's, 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 or affections or whatever. You use these excuse. There are three things that we use and we prioritize over the kingdom even today. I'm guilty. I mean, I've seen this in my own life. And Jesus basically says to all of them, well, your excuses excuse you. Look at what he says in verse 21. So the slave came back and reported these things to his master. And then in anger, the master of the house told his slave, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Tell them they're coming in and they're going to eat a lot. Master, the slave said, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. Then the master told the slaves, well then go out in the highways and the lanes and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Wedding banquet, focusing on the end of time, focusing on the culmination of the coming of Messiah. And here are these excuses. And he says, your excuses excuse you. They would have never thought of bringing in beggars from the street. That's sleazy. That's, they're unclean. We don't know what they're bringing in. These are powerful images. And Jesus is telling this to the ones who are hosting a banquet, who have tried to set him up who don't understand the fullness of these banquets, and he's sending them out into all these fields being, you don't even know where they're coming from. This message means that everybody, everybody and anybody, from the highest to the shamed and the disreputable, may now enter the kingdom of God and are welcome at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Here are some banquet realities I want you to hear today. The people are able to turn down his invitation. There's choice. You can make all the excuses you want. You've been invited to the table. You've received the invitation, but you can turn it down. He wants to give hope. He wants to give salvation. He wants to give heaven. But sometimes the everyday concerns of our lives get over the banquet and we can turn it down. Notice we're not saved by our own effort. They're not, they're not brought to the banquet by their own effort. It's by invitation. I want to ask you, have you examined your excuses to the master lately? It's humbling. And I've found that I've done it too often. But notice this part, that God offers his gifts to all because he wants his hall to be filled. He wants it 
full. Here's Jesus even emphasizing he wants everyone at the banquet. All of them. Who do you think isn't capable or able or welcome at the table? He wants all, everyone at the table, at the banquet. And then look what he does. God sends his servants to do the inviting and the bringing. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 21. Look at verse 23. Uh, let's just use 23 as an illustration. Go out into the highways and lanes and make them come in so that my house may be filled. You know, we're the servants. It's our job to bring them in. Remember how I went into this parable? Yeah. He said to the person that had this great sounding, wonderful line, you admire the ideal, but are you prepared to act on it? Am I prepared to act on it? I love the idea of the wedding feast of the Lamb. I did a funeral yesterday morning and we talked about how we're all together in that great and glorious day at the marriage feast of the Lamb. I like that idea, but are we ready and prepared to act on it? That's the invitation. And if you notice in Luke's narrative, at this point, Jesus leaves the banquet. They're back out on the road. And he turned to these disciples in verse 25 and 26 and said, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Here's the challenge. And hate sounds harsh, but it's based on God's love. It's not against people. Jesus instructs us to even love our enemies. You can find that in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But the Greek verb here is based on a, a Hebrew and Aramaic expression, to love less. So to hate means to love less. It's not, it's not taking the love that we have for those around us, father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters. It's that the love of Jesus is even greater. If you can't love me even greater than the love you have for these, notice how much that just increases love. You can't be my disciple. This is important. If you can't carry your own cross. And they would have known that. Hundreds. Uh, they, they even tell the historians tell, and we sometimes fall into this trap that we think that Jesus was the only person crucified or there were very few. Crucifixion was used by the Romans through this period of time a lot. And they even lined the road from Jerusalem down to Caesarea Philippi, or Caesarea by the sea, with crosses when there was a rebellion. And they hung on there for days. They would have understood that this is a major, major commitment. Jesus isn't in the surprise business. He wants them to understand. And he tells twin stories so that they can understand and grasp that. Verse 28, which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he's laid the foundation and can't finish it. All the onlookers will look and make fun of him, saying, oh, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Just several years earlier than this, about A.D. 27, there was this poorly built amphitheater that collapsed, and historians estimate 50,000 people died. This was a, a, a teaching tool that they would have grasped because that, that was big news and they would have remembered it. And then he, he, he goes on. Well, what about a king going to war against another king? Will he not first sit down and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes with him with 20,000? What a foolish army commander that doesn't even 
figure this out. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. He's not checking this out. He's not even being wise. He's not counting the cost. Herod Antipas, one of Herod the Great's offspring, recently, at the time of Jesus, lost this war with a neighboring Roman landholder because he just didn't think about it. He went and did it. It's about counting the cost. He says, I want you to understand, in verse 33, in the same way, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now, salt's good, and if salt loses its taste, how will it be made salty again? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out, and anyone who has ears to hear should listen. He wants us to listen. He wants us to understand. Yeah, the invitation is open to all but to really follow after me. It's going to cost. And it may cost you dearly. I want you to understand that the cost here is nothing compared to the reward of eternity. This is both a command and a process and a personal commitment to go beyond the conversion experience and to walk with Christ. To fulfill the mission of the church, bring them in. This is the important message. This is the important word. All of this is tied in together. And Jesus just wants to highlight it for us. In the background of the congregation I serve, there's a, one of the early brethren. It's a guy by the name of Alexander Mack, and he had to count the cost to follow after Jesus. And it ended up costing him his entire business. He spent his entire wealth and was eventually kicked out of his home. And he wrote a poem, a hymn in German, 13 verses recounting what it took to count the cost. But I want to close today with a lyric from Steve Camp. I heard him sing it a number of years ago at a pastor's conference in Nashville, and it gripped my soul, and I listen to it every so often now. Because Jesus wanted to make sure that we understood that we counted the cost, and it was fully worth it. To love him more than father or mother, to love him more than even your own flesh. And this is the line that gripped me to give all that you are for all that he is. This is the gospel according to Jesus. To give all that you are for all that he is. Have you count the cost? Do you understand the beauty and the glory and the wonder of the banquet that is to come? And do you embrace that call? God bless you, and let's continue on this journey, understanding all Jesus has for us. Amen.